Greetings, my children. It is time for Sunday School Bonanza once more. This week in Mormon's production, uh, we're here specifically to go through gospel doctrine lessons, in this case the Old Testament, and uh, talk about the lessons we have and how the, we can study them better, be better prepared, or in the event you can't even go because your calling prohibits you or you're not going to church that day. Either way, hopefully this will help you out a bit. Before we get to the lesson, we have a new host with us this week in the studio. Eric Johnson is joining us from his closet in Las Vegas. Hello. Everyone. Hello. Hello from a closet. Yeah, he is literally in his closet, and as he describes it, uh, hiding from his children. So, And also great acoustics. <laughs> great acoustics. No echo. No it's echo. Abs- delightful times uh, all around. E- Eric's been, uh, I guess you've been a patron of the show for some time, and so we are... Yeah, long-time listener, first-time caller. Here we go. So he's with us. Uh, he's said many hurtful things to me on Twitter before, but I know oh. it's with love. I know it's with love, and this... I kid. This time together is going to be part of our healing process, and so I'm grateful for it. It's going to be wonderful. I kid. But we're glad well, you're here, for Eric. The opportunity. Yeah, we're thank excited. I, we, I love doing these shows. I have a lot of fun with our other podcasts. Sunday School Bonanza is just, I love it. It's always edifying for me, and I learn a lot of stuff, especially from my co-hosts, because you see how everyone sort of internalizes gospel topics differently. Different things stick out to different people. There's always good stuff to take in. So uh, the lesson we're on this week, lesson 39, How Beautiful Upon the Mountains. And listeners, you will be shocked what book we are still in. No, you won't. We're still in Isaiah, folks. Still going. I think there's one more Isaiah lesson after this. We really, it's, it's fascinating that we spend so much time on Isaiah, but it speaks to the importance of, uh, of the old prophet, I guess. I mean, when you think about yeah. it, you know, I mean, Nephi quoted him directly. He didn't even just like true paraphrase Isaiah teaching. She just said, you know what? We have this, I'm just going to quote this directly because it's that important for our posterity that I'm going to just use up all this space and copy down his words onto plates. So. It is, and, and we do have a lot of lessons on that. But, uh, boy, I wish we would have had more time Job, just just a personal <laughs> Isn't it funny that Job, <laughs> Job, Job is 40-odd chapters long and you get one lesson? One lesson. I'm actually reading Job right now. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm, I've been reading the Old Testament and now the gospel doctrine lessons have kind of passed me with where I'm yeah. at, which is which is sad because before I felt like I could bring more to these podcasts because I'd kind of <laughs> like already been reading it. And now I'm playing catch up. But uh, Job was great. Job is awesome. Beautiful. Yeah. Book. And this is, this is equally awesome. By the way, if you want to study up uh, Isaiah chapters 50 through 53, other good reading would be Mosiah 14 through 15. Uh, all this great, great resources. Read all these things and get prepared. You might get hit with the attention activity. All it's going to be is your teacher is going to ask you what your favorite hymn is about the Savior and why. Mm. And we usually make fun of these, but I will actually say that's a good thing to think about right now. So on the spot, you're not trying to kind of ponder it. Think about what hymns actually matter to you. I mean, I have a deep love for music and the power of, of worship through hymns. So think and ponder which hymns really mean something to you, which ones kind of drive the spirit into your life. That's an important part of our worship. Do you have hymns that you prefer in Spanish over English? I know you served a Spanish-speaking mission. I did as well. Um, I love called to serve more because you get four verses of it in Spanish and you only get two in English. Yeah, much That's... more service in uh, in Spanish-speaking countries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I haven't done a lot of Spanish for so long. In our lovely Deserets, oh, com- it's almost comical yes. in Spanish. So that one's it is. Fun. <laughs> and uh, I also love that one in Spanish. Yeah. Which other ones do you have? Anything? Well, um. There is sunshine in my soul today. Ah, yes. is, is a very popular one. I don't know why for missionaries to sing in Spanish, but uh, yeah. Where did you uh, mission anyway? Argentina, beautiful Argentina. country. Yeah, Buenos Aires. North, south, east, west. Uh, west. The Buenos Aires West there mission was my there. mission. There are many there. There are many in Buenos That's right. Aires. That's right. But you still only have one temple, so whatever. <laughs> of course, so does Spain. So what do I care? I mean, who am I to talk? And you go to the temple in Spain, they're like, no Spaniards there. It's all Portuguese, French, and Italian people. They're, I don't know where else Really? Spaniards, pretty much. <laughs> oh. Spaniards so are very self-effacing about their uh, piety, I guess you could say. <laughs> but they're fine. So, anyways, uh, brass tacks. So, in Isaiah 52, Isaiah. Quick, quick section leading off. But th- there's a quick verse here in Isaiah 52, 7. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. And I think it's, it's interesting here because uh, 
what, what, like, why does Isaiah talk about the messenger's feet? Why does he even bother to say how good upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings? You could use almost any other noun to sort of get this point across. Why, did, why do you think he focused on feet? Well, I, I think it has to do with uh, his affection for feet. He originally just liked looking at people's feet. Oh, okay. Um, Isaiah had a bit of a foot thing going well, he on. Well, did, he did wander naked through Sudan or wherever that was. <laughs> That's you right. Know, you never know. That's right. Well, I think it has Easy to do with, you know, messengers, the idea of as a messenger, you know, bike messengers use bikes. Um, messengers in the time of, I, of Isaiah, you you hear the story about the, the origins of the word marathon, you know, the, the mm-hmm. guy who's trying to bring a message associated with, with war. And the, the, way you, the way you would deliver a message was with your feet. So... The the in a, in the same way that we talk about the the blessings of the internet, right? You would talk about the blessings of the feet of somebody like Isaiah, I guess, because you had no internet. So um, that was the, that was the manner in which they received the message was thanks to the feet of of whoever it was that was bringing the message. So you mean today you could say like how beautiful upon the mountains is the Facebook account of him that bringeth good tidings? In a that's way. right. How, how at least at least is, for everyday members, yeah. That's right. How beautiful is President uh, Monson's Twitter account? They're getting better. They, they are, are getting better. They're they're learning more and more how to utilize it, which is nice. And uh, it's 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 a great blessing because, like you say, it just symbolizes a messenger. But messengers come in many forms. And today, yeah, we're we're blessed with messaging in all kinds of ways. I mean, the messenger, him or herself, is one thing. But how many outlets do we have to receive it? Right. How lucky right. are we? We're not reliant on just. A prophet up on a soapbox or a King Benjamin requiring people to write stuff down because people can't, you know, they face their tents toward him, but his voice can only carry away. so far. Right. I mean, we are very fortunate that we're able to receive counsel today from modern prophets through just myriad avenues. And mm-hmm. that's, we just had general conference. And I love that every time we have general conference now, I feel like more and more outlets have opened up to, to make it accessible to people. I mean, yeah. I remember when it first started just streaming online, that was such a great novelty. And now we're in a, in a place where I can pop, bring it up on YouTube on my phone, plop it to a Chromecast and then just sit on my, in my chair and live the dream. It's great. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. I remember as a little kid, we got it on our local cable access because there was a woman in our ward who worked for the local cable company. And so she was able to finagle or whatever that on for, for a general conference, it would show up on our local cable access. Yeah. We used to actually have it. Um, and that was huge well for us. That was huge. It was big for us. We used to have it here in D.C., and Comcast keeps saying they still have it, but they don't. They're liars. They got rid of it. Oh. Comcast are liars, everyone. If you take nothing else away from this lesson, just take away that Comcast Amen. are liars. Um, so that's the basic first section. There's not a lot more to it. Just the, the value of messengers. Ponder uh, you know, when you've had an opportunity to also serve as a messenger. And, and to share your testimony with people or, or your beliefs, whatever it may be, but to, to act in that capacity of, of being a messenger. Yeah, and one quick little note on that. Uh-huh. Um, the, the lesson kind of points you towards Mosiah 14 and 15. Yeah. And here we have the prophet Abinadi who also, you know, he quotes uh, from Isaiah, and, and we'll get there. We'll get to 53. But the benefit that you have of the Book of Mormon is that you have prophets like Nephi, you have prophets like Abinadi, you have people like Christ himself commenting on on scripture that we already have, commenting on things like Isaiah. And so in chapter uh, 15, for example, mm-hmm. of Mosiah, you have Abinadi talking about Isaiah, talking about this idea of the the feet of those who, who bring glad tidings, and he ties it to messengers, messengers like prophets, messengers like himself. And that that's a great resource too that the Book of Mormon can can give you insight on, on the Book of Isaiah. Now, also in these chapters, you were telling me before we recorded. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this, but you talked about it. Say sing songy chapters, not sing songy. What was it? They're uh, sorry. Servant songs is what servant, they're called. Servant that's songs. The, Expl- that's the term that explain they use. The, explain this to me again, if you would. Okay, there are some places in the Book of Isaiah where Isaiah will be talking about the servant of the Lord. Uh, my servant does this, my servant does that, and um, gosh, I was trying to find one real quick. Uh, <laughs> You're okay. Um, no worries. And in these, what you have is this symbol of somebody uh, who is called by the Lord to do something, and Isaiah will explain, well, my servant did this, uh, my servant had this experience, 
Some biblical scholars will say, well, the servant, who is the servant? Um, I'm looking in 52, verse 13. He says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extol and be very high. 13 actually kind of continues from chapter 52. 13 goes into 53, really, of this same symbol of this servant Mm -hmm. of the Lord. So the servant song is a poetic, they call it a song because it was written in more of a poetic fashion. You can't really see that when you when you look at our version of the Bible. But I'll give a little plug for um, online versions of the the Bible that have uh, multiple versions that you can read side by side. Sometimes you can read it in a different version. You'll see that they, that they will write it in that poetic format, and that's kind of neat to see too. But, uh, but going back to, so there's, there's a servant, and Isaiah's writing a poem about him. Some biblical scholars say, well, this refers to Israel after they've been delivered from the Babylonian captivity. Um, but I really think it's more apt to apply it to the Messiah or some messianic figure, our Messiah in, in the case of, of Jesus Christ. And so you read these about these servants. And when you read about the servant, you can, I think you can see that when you read it, that, boy, this does sound like the Savior. It does sound like the Messiah when I read about yeah. this. And that's kind of the beauty of so much of Isaiah, but these chapters in particular, so so much of it alludes to or, or discusses the Savior's his role and his sacrifice for us. And that's a great thing to pull out of, of a number of these chapters, especially once you slip into 51 through 53. I mean, there, there are so many different things. And even the lesson sort of bullet points a lot of these different things, you know, and we don't have to go through all of them. You should look into the lesson yourself, read through all the chapters, and, and hit on them. But uh, I, I personally have always had a major soft spot for Isaiah 53. I've always find that, found that the whole chapter, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful verses in Scripture. I've sung an entire song where the only text of the hymn is all of Isaiah 53, which is pretty. It's called, Surely He Has Borne Our Griefs, and that's what, that's what it says in uh, verse 4. But you can build an entire song on that, and it's, it's incredible because it's like this. I can't even do it justice, but it talks about, you know, the Savior's humiliation and his sufferings, how he makes his soul an offering for us. He intercedes for us. And, uh, you know, he, like it says, he was wounded for his transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And what does it say right after that? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's... You think about ancient Israel, and you think about how directly Isaiah is talking about the power of the Messiah and, and what the atonement is really going to encapsulate for the Israelites. And I, I feel like when you look at these people who are so dogmatic in some ways in their observance of, of Mosaic law, I feel like it's so easy to forget this whole notion of the atonement that was being promised them in a way. And I'm not discounting it entirely, but I love reading these verses from Isaiah because it's such a clear reminder of of who the Savior will be and what he will go through on our behalf. Very, very directly. Eric, yeah, in those, verses, okay? <laughs> in those verses where it talks about, you know, sheep going astray. Yeah. In the next verse, then it talks about, it refers to the lamb and how he's the lamb. I thought that was kind of some interesting symbolism. We're the sheep and then he's this lamb who's humbly brought to the, to the slaughter. Mm-hmm. But we're the sheep that kind of wander. Um the other thing I wanted to point out was yeah. they talk about how he is a man of sorrows. He is acquainted with grief. And then in verse 4, and he will, as you said, Jeff, he, yeah. will, he will bear our grief. He will carry our sorrows. Again, kind of the interesting parallelism that we, that we see in Isaiah. Yeah, there's so much. Chapter 3 is almost heartbreaking. You know, He's a man of sorrows. That's how I've always pictured the Savior. I picture him being, being a happy, a joyful person who understands the the beauty of the atonement that's being wrought on our behalf but at the same time a man who deep down is is feels the sorrow and the, and the trouble of the world and of what he has to take upon himself like you know you see someone who he puts on the good face and he's genuinely happy but deep down inside he feels deep things and it's so sad when you see right there he was despised and we esteemed him not and how easily do we in these modern days realize that we often still don't esteem the Savior perhaps as we should. We don't, we don't think of his atoning sacrifice for us and of the enabling power of the atonement in our day-to-day because we're humans and we get busy and we just don't think about stuff like this. 
But that's a great stark reminder right there from Isaiah that he's he's making a point that Israel does not esteem their Lord, and we should be you know be careful about that and make sure that we always esteem the Lord. Yeah, exactly. On a on kind of a final note there, I thought it was huh? interesting in verse ten. There's this phrase, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And and that can kind of be an odd phrase maybe for us in, in English, the idea that that the Lord or or that uh, our Father would be pleased that the Messiah, that, that Christ was bruised uh, for us. But I, but, well, I don't know, I guess, okay. I can see on on paper I fully understand why that seems like a weird idea, but I'm also kind of I'm running it through my head right now why I think it's not bad. I guess. I yeah. Know. Yeah. Because I would say that Heavenly Father would would be pleased because He knows that the only way to bring about the redemption of His children is through a sacrifice of His Son, and so if Christ is going through these things and suffering is bruised, it also indicates that the plan is going forward. I guess in a way, which. Which is difficult, but at the same time, a necessary, necessary step that a loving Heavenly Father can, can look upon with joy, knowing that the way is being opened up for us to overcome spiritual and physical death once more. Right. It's pretty cool. Uh, another thing, I'm just going to jack this from you because you mentioned it when we were talking before, but I love it when you go into the Book of Mormon because Mosiah 14 is basically Isaiah 53. But the great thing is that's Abinadi talking to the priests of Noah. But then we get Mosiah 15, which is actually... Abinadi explaining more of it, which is kind of cool, which is a, a solid companion piece that we don't actually get reading just Isaiah. So when you have the Book of Mormon side by side, you're able to give yourself a deeper understanding of of the preceding text, which, uh, you know, which is cool. Another great example to me about how it's great to have uh, an open canon and uh, scripture beyond just the Bible that was translated by men in England some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, okay, so other than that, they talk about some of our responsibilities. I don't know if there's anything you want to touch on on the third bullet point of the lesson, Eric, or not, if there's anything that jumps out. If not, it's fine, too. We have responsibilities, and we yeah. should respond It's what to you those. would expect. Like, don't be a dork. Just, you know, That's right. don't do what you know you're supposed to do. I hate to call them seminary answers. They're a little bit more profound than that. But uh, I, I like Isaiah 52, 11, depart from the wickedness of the world. You know, do not touch unclean things. Be clean. I think... That's the best reminder. Be clean, as President Hinckley always said. I am clean. I am clean. There you go. Yep. Well, I think this one's good. Folks, study up on this one. I think it's uh, good times all around. So read up on your Isaiah 50 through 53. Study it along with an institute manual. Something like that can be helpful. Uh, so. Oh, hey. Uh, yeah, hey, buddy. We'll see how this one goes. We lost a connection a little bit there. Anyways, point is, this is a great lesson. Lesson 39, how beautiful... Upon the mountains found in Isaiah. I'd like to thank Eric for being here with us. And uh, please find us, of course, at thisweekinmormons.com. Find us on iTunes, on all the stuff. Just find us everywhere and uh, enjoy the show. Hi, Eric. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to have you. All right, guys. Uh, and we appreciate hearing from you as well. Please leave us a review on iTunes. That would be great. And uh, let us know how we're doing. Hope to talk to you soon. This has been another edition of Sunday School Bonanza by This Week.